Chapter 1, Introduction to Database Management for CIS 307. The student should have read the chapter prior to the lecture. The chapter begins really on page 2 and talks about uh, spreadsheet problems. Now, I always say that a typical computer user comes into a computer and it tends to be a word processing package that they learn first. After they've learned something like Word, they move on to something like Excel and they learn the ins and outs of spreadsheets. At some point, they start to hit the, the issues of spreadsheets and that's the moment that the typical user is then going to broaden their um, uh, what they know about you know the software and and broaden their their knowledge into the area of databases. So that's a typical user is they're going from a, a word processor to a spreadsheet to a database program like Access. On the flip side, sometimes you have people getting into databases because that really was their intention. And, and these are going to be people who actually study databases or programming and are coming at it from the angle of much larger databases that are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of users and, and with front ends and back ends, etc. And, and this text really does a good job of exploring it from both angles. But they start off and they're talking about people who are coming at it from that bottom up. They've hit some of those limitations of spreadsheets. One of the biggest problems you're going to have with spreadsheets is redundancy. And that's when people end up having to type the same data and storing the same data again and again and again. There's a great example of a redundant spreadsheet on the uh, figure 1.1 page 2 of your text and the brackets there are showing you how you're repeating the customer number, the customer name, the order number, etc. for Ferguson's, again for Johnson's department store. Because you have to type this stuff again and again and again. That's redundancy. Another limitation of a spreadsheet is that you actually have to have multiple files. Even when you get to a point where you're starting to eliminate some of that redundancy, we're using some of the very limited database um, features of Excel. You still have to have separate files or even separate sheets, you can't really directly relate them. So I may have one spreadsheet for my customer's names and addresses and another spreadsheet where I'm only referencing them as a customer number. When I want to join that together, I've got to do a lot of copying and pasting and into a third file in order to really get that final report. And a database is really one big file with multiple tables and, and I can just relate the stuff by drawing a line and boom, I don't have to do copying and pasting and, and all this other stuff. Spreadsheet programs have a lot of security limitations. I can put a password on my Excel file that limits who can open it or who can save it, but I can't put uh, security on only certain columns or only certain sheets. When I get into a database program, I can secure a field. I can have one person who's allowed to change data in this area but not another area. Somebody else who's allowed to um, maybe only read. Somebody else who, who can, you know, just only type one number in one spot. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I have a, a lot of, of secure capabilities when I get into my uh, database applications. Spreadsheets, of course, have a size limitation on the number of rows and columns. Now, that was greatly expanded with the release of 2007, but before then, a sp typical spreadsheet had, you know, about a 65,500 uh, row limitation, about 256 columns. Now has about a 65,500 column limitation and about a little over a million row limitation. Still, think about a, a database like the number of visa transactions that happen in an hour. I don't know the number, but it could be a million. Certainly, it's a million in a day. So how you couldn't store that in a spreadsheet. So you, a, a database has no size limitations. It, you're out of space, get another server. You don't need to worry about the, uh, having a limitation of, that's it, it's full, now we have to start another file. Spreadsheets don't allow multiple users to be in them, editing them simultaneously.
If you've ever been at, had a spreadsheet out on a network and one person's opened it, if another user attempts to open that file, it will allow me as the second user to open that file. Uh, it'll allow me to make changes, but I'd have to save it in a copy. Somebody else is in that file. So I can't be in it editing it simultaneously, but with a database, I can have um, allow multiple people to be in there at the same time. Now, multiple people cannot be in the same record simultaneously. So, for example, if I'm editing John Doe's name uh, or address, you know, basically is his name and address information, you can place an order for him that's in a different part of the different record a different table but you couldn't edit his name and address but you could be editing Mary Smith's name and address because I'm editing John Doe's so um, multiple users can be in the file editing it and changing it at the same time when you um, flip over to page four that's where your book really starts to talk, give you a little bit of a background about a database and what it is and what it means. And the first uh, word that they define there is an entity. An entity is defined as a person, place, object, event, or idea for which you want to store and process data. In a database management system, an entity is often referred to as a table. In the same uh, area there on page four, your, tech, your author defines an attribute as a characteristic or a property of an entity. And in a database management system, an attribute is often referred to as a field or a column. So if you take a look at figure 1.3 on page four, what you're seeing there is two specific entities or tables, one for a sales rep and one for a customer. So if we look at the rep, they have specific attributes or fields, areas that we're going to track about that sales rep. These are represented on in figure 1-3 as the boxes. Rep name, last name, first name, street, city, state, zip, commission, and rate. <coughs> and then below it, we have a table for customer. And the graphical representation, again, shows the, the various boxes for the attributes, customer name, number, name, street, city, state, zip, balance, credit limit, and rep number. Notice that the rep number, the sales representative's number, appears in both tables. A couple words that they don't really discuss at this point in the chapter, but they will coming up, are uh, primary key and foreign key. Your primary key for your sales rep table is that rep number. Each sales representative can only be in this table one time and each representative has a, a unique number. Think about where you might work. You most likely have a, an employee identification number or here at the college you're a student. You have a student ID number. You may know it, you may not. You can walk into the registrar's office and ask him what it is, but reality is that's your number. You are the one and only student who has that number. But over here in the customer table, the customer's primary key or the one thing that uniquely identifies them is the customer number. I might have two John Smiths. I might have two people at the same address or with the same balance or the same credit limit. But I've only got one customer one and I only have one customer two. So it's the primary key. Primary key uniquely identifies each record in that table. But one salesman better have more than one customer or he's not going to make very much money. So over here when you see that rep number in the customer table, that's called a foreign key. A foreign key is a field that it is not the primary key of that table, but it, that field is the primary key of another table. So in this case, in the customer table, rep number is not the primary key, but it is the primary key of another table, rep. So it's this field that I'm going to build a relationship on between the two tables. Now your uh, figure 1.4 on page 5, the authors graphically represented this relationship by using the, the previous 
um, diagram and just drawing a line to show you the relationship from rep number to rep number. What you see in the, on, the, on my screen here is a graphical representation of what it would look like in Microsoft Access. So the table on the left is my rep, the table on the right is my customer, and the line is, is linking the rep number to the rep number. This field over here has a little key symbol next to it indicating that it is the primary key of this table. Over here it does not have a key symbol. This field does, so this is the primary key of the customer table. But this relationship has to be connected through the same field. There are actually three different types of relationships that can exist in a database management system. A one-to-one -one relationship, a one-to-many relationship, and a many-to-many -many relationship. And in chapter one, your author spends quite a bit of time on one-to-many relationships, but I want to go ahead and talk about all three of them. In a one-to-one -one relationship, one record in the primary table relates to no more than one record in the related table. Graphically, again using Microsoft Access, this would be an example of this. Notice the relationship line has a 1 and a 1. This type of relationship you don't see very often, but in many database programs, you, from the security standpoint, you cannot secure a field, you can only secure a table. So let's say I had a lot of information here on sales reps, their name, their address, their commission, but I have a couple of things that I want to keep secure. I don't want everybody to know it. Their social security number and their base salary. But reality is if I have 10 reps, 10 records in this rep table, I'm going to have 10 records in this table. If I have 20 records over in the, the primary table, I'm going to have 20 records in the related table. So I'm never going to have more than one in the related table. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. This type of relationship is definitely used the least. The most common type of relationship you're ever going to see is a one-to-many relationship, and that's the one your author talks about the most, where one record in the primary table relates to many records in the related table. And again, we're back to our reps and customers. If my salespeople only had one customer each, I wouldn't make any money. A sales rep has to have multiple customers. So one rep has many customers. It's a fairly simple concept when you think about it. And by far it's the most it's the most common type of relationship. While this is the only type addressed by your author, you're going to need to know all three types in order to get through your your uh, chapter 1 exam. The third type of relationship is a many-to-many -many relationship. Many records in the primary table relate to many records in the related table. A good example of this would be maybe something like office supplies and suppliers. Now think with me for a minute. I have many different types of office supplies. I have pens, paper, pencils, etc. And I have different stores or suppliers that I can go to to get them. Office Max, Staples, Office Depot. So one office supply, pens, can be purchased from many suppliers. I might have a, a Bic Uniball or whatever it is, pen, black, that particular pen that I want, and I can probably walk into Staples and buy it. I can walk into Office Max and buy it. But on the flip side, if you think about it, I can walk into Office Max and buy many supplies. I can buy my pens, I can buy my paper, and I can buy my pencils. So many supplies can be purchased from many suppliers. While data is sometimes related in this fashion, a database management system cannot portray this type of a relationship. Reality is that's the type of relationship that exists between these two tables in theory, but I can't develop it that way. As the database developer, when I'm working on that design, I need to be able to identify that, ooh, these two tables have a many-to-many -many relationship. And I need to break that relationship down into two or more one-to-many relationships. So in this case, here's my same two tables, my office supplies and my suppliers. 
But reality is that when I purchase that pen from Staples, it's going to be at a certain cost. And when I purchase that pen from Office Max, it's going to be at a different cost. So anything that has to do with the supply itself the the paper the brand of paper the color of paper anything that has to do with that actual office that supply is going to go on my office supplies table and anything that has to do with the supplier their office max they're on Kimberly Road in Davenport their phone number is 563-555-1212 specific to that supplier it's going to go on the supplies table but anything that has to do with my purchase of that supply from that supplier is going to go into my supply info table. Notice my primary key. The primary key of my office supply table is my inventory number, whatever number I've assigned to each product in my supply cabinet. And the primary key of my supplier table is, again, a number assigned to each supplier. Office Max is one, Staples is two, etc. But the primary key of the supply info table is a concatenated key. It's the combination of the inventory number and the supplier. It's these two fields together that uniquely identify the records in this table. So a many-to-many -many relationship can exist in theory, but I actually can't have it in the final design. It has to be broken down into at least two or more one-to-many relationships. As you continue in your text, you're going to see then that they begin to talk about ER or entity relationship diagrams. This really starts on page 9. An entity relationship diagram or an ER diagram is nothing more than a visual way to represent a database design. And there is actually a much better article on Wikipedia that explains the various shapes and identifications in the di diagram that you're going to see more commonly used when you get out into the real world. And I've got the, the beginning of it here. Just go to Wikipedia and put in ER diagrams and this entity relationship model article should pop right up. You're most commonly going to see your tables or entities represented by, and you can see the green rectangle, your attributes represented by circular buttons and your relationship represented by the diamonds and the lines. So and this will really go in and, and explain what is you will more commonly see. Your author does it just a little bit differently. There's three specific examples um, in chapter one where they refer to an ER diagram and the first one's on page nine in figure 1.7. What's nice about that one is they've actually gone through and they're trying to describe each item in there. In the author's representation, an entity appears in a rectangle. Remember, an entity is another way of saying a table. Those two words, entity and table, are, are pretty much interchangeable in our database world. As a matter of fact, more commonly, you'll probably hear the people really working in it refer to them as tables. And the fields or the attributes for that entity are also listed in the rectangle rather than off in separate bubbles as you'll see in that Wikipedia article. So the table is represented by the rectangle and a line represents the relationship. So when you look at that figure 1.7 on page 9 you're going to see a line drawn from the rep table to the customer table. Now what the author does is if you notice on the customer table into the line there's a dot or a circle filled in black circle and the author explains that he or she is using that to represent many and the lack of a dot to represent one. So when I look at that figure 1 7 I'm seeing no dot on the left hand side that means one and a dot on the right hand side of that line between rep and customer the dot meaning many. Remember the access screens I just showed you a moment, moment ago? How there was an a infinity symbol used to represent many and an actual numeric number one to represent one? Traditionally, though, it's an N that's used to represent many, the algebraic N, and again, a number one. At least that's the way I've seen it documented in, in, in the places I've worked more than anything else. Again, the column or the field names or the attributes, those words are fairly interchangeable. And the author's representation appear inside the rectangle, but traditionally they would appear in bubbles um, outside of the rectangles as shown in that Wikipedia example. 
So the three examples in this chapter are the one there on page 9 where they actually spell it all out. And later they have two more uh, ER diagrams, one on page 22 in figure 119 and another one on page 27 in figure 1-25. On these other two, they don't spell out, they don't give you the descriptions. They're just giving you the visual diagram of the database. So those would be good ones to look at to make sure you can follow the logic there. And if you can't follow the logic in either one of those on page 22 or 27, you'll want to email me or, or put it into a discussion group so that we can get that addressed to make sure you do understand. Make sure you can identify everything. Now another item that is important to me that we learn to that we learn about and we explore this semester are naming conventions and unfortunately your textbook author does not completely follow naming conventions. Naming convention is the idea that you actually identify the type of object within the name of the object. For example, your author would refer to it as uh, to the entity as customer. I would refer to it as TBL, customer, identifying the type of object, table, within the name of the object. Or if it was a query, I might call it QRY, customer. Sometimes I'll even get a little more detailed into the type of table it is or the type of query it is, etc. And what's important to understand is that you need to use something that makes sense for you. Some people use prefixes like I do. Some people use suffixes. They put the TBL on the end. Uh, more people use prefixes. The advantage of a prefix is when you take all your objects and sort them alphabetically, then all your tables are together because they all start TBL, as opposed to your queries, which all start QRY. So a prefix definitely has some advantages over a suffix. But again, it's something that makes sense to you. You're the developer. If you're looking for a place to start, I rep recommend the Lazinski Naming Conventions as a good place to start. And of course, there is a, a good Wikipedia article on the Lazinski Naming Conventions. Even though twice I've referred to Wikipedia, let me tell you that I, I don't refer a Wikipedia article until I've reviewed it. And I make sure that it actually, you know, some of them are fabulous and some of them not so much. But these, this one's very good and actually talks about a lot of naming conventions that um, are commonly used. And that would be a good place, in my opinion, for you to start if you don't have never used them or you're not really sure what to do with them. Moving on to, to page 10 in your chapter, here the author starts to talk about some um, common database management systems and refers to some of the popular ones as Access, Oracle, DB2, MySQL, or SQL Server. SQL is often referred to as SQL, so you'll usually hear me say SQL Server or MySQL. Goes on to talk a bit about database design and defines that as deciding on a product. So in other words, the database designer has to decide whether they're going to do this in Access or in Oracle or in SQL Server and then determining the actual table structure within that product. A table structure is what we refer to as the back end of the database, the part the user never really sees. Often the designer will, will however, get into the front end as well. So the author talks about forms and defines those as screen objects used to maintain and view data in the database, the front end. The person who sits down to input or edit data in your, that's stored in the database does not need to have database knowledge if a form or a front end structure has been set up properly. They don't need to go take an access class because you're going to ask, ask them to input data into an access database. They don't even need to know it's access if you've done it right. They just need to know it's a database. Through the, the user interface that you've designed in forms, the user will actually be inputting the data. And the third piece that comes into play is reports. And the author doesn't really define those, but reports are objects used to retrieve or print data. The big difference between forms and reports, well, forms allow you to edit data, reports are static, but forms are designed for the screen, reports are generally designed for a printer. 
<coughs> Starting on page, uh, really page 12, they go into nine different advantages of database processing. And I think you probably want to review these and make sure that you know what some of these advantages are. Uh, the first one they discuss is getting more information from the same amount of data. And again, I'm not going to, you can read these paragraphs as well as I can talk about them. I just want to draw your attention to them in the chapter. Um, but of course, with a database, uh, it, it's amazing how much more can come out of it through the querying, through the criteria than you ever could begin to get out of it if it was in a flat file spreadsheet format. The sharing of data across multiple functions and, and multiple people within your organization. Balancing conflicting requirements. It's going to ha uh, have people, when, when, when you have two different departments who want two different things, the database sometimes brings people together and makes one department understand better the data in another department and, and come, come together and figure out a, a solution that will be the best for everybody. A database, of course, controls that redundancy. You're always going to have some redundancy, data that has to appear in more than one table. But a database truly limits the amount of, of redundancy. Facilitating consistency. A database can allow me, for example, to make sure that the two-character abbreviation for state is always in uppercase, or that when it says zip, that you have to put in numeric data. You can't you know, put in something else or a phone number that it, it can control that it must have a zip code. So it really can make your data be much more um, consistent across the board and as a result improve the integrity of your data. You know, one question that I, I'm often asked is, is it better to force something to be required well, sometimes that makes somebody make something up. To me, I'd rather ha know that the data I have is valid. And so I would, I would pr prefer a higher integrity of data. But I, have, I can all kinds of rules and different database management systems that I can put into place to make a field must be required or, or that if you do input it, it must be this. Or maybe, you know, if one field is an A, then another field can only be a B, C, or D. But if the first one is a F, the next one can only be an X, Y, Z. I mean, all types of rules and restrictions that I can put on in order to improve the integrity of my data. Most database management systems have, have greatly expanded security over any type of spreadsheet system. Um, again, where I can actually assign different levels of security to different users, create groups of users, who can see what. Some people can see, others can edit, some people can't even see. Overall, once it's done and in place, we're going to see increased productivity throughout the company, and we're going to provide data independence that lets me change the structure of the database without actually changing the front end. So my back end and my front end are separated. I can actually tweak one or the other independent. Makes me uh, have much more reliable data. Of course, there's never advantages to anything if there aren't disadvantages. And these are really outlined on page 14. Databases have much larger file sizes. Now, you don't have limits to your file size other than your physical limit of how much server space you have. But that database, you, you know, can, can go across multiple servers. So you're never going to hit a wall, a limit like you would in a spreadsheet where you cannot go any further. You may have to expand your storage space, but you're always going to be able to go farther. Because of the nature of a database, it is more complex than a spreadsheet system. Um, the, the more data we want to put in it, the more complicated our table structure is going to be, the more um, knowledge that that database administrator and those database designers are going to have to have. And of course, the more complex the system, the greater the impact if the system fails. If I have an integrated database through my company, uh, for example, here at, at, at my school, we have an integrated database that controls registration, it controls accounts payable, accounts receivable, human resources, um, you know, uh, the portal aspects, your email, it's all controlled by one massive database. If that goes down, you don't just lose HR for a little while, 
you lose everything. So there's a much greater impact when that goes down. And it is a more difficult recovery. I have to have a much bigger backup plan in place because I've integrated so much into that one database. So while there's advantages, there are similarly disadvantages. And that summarizes the important features out of Chapter 1.